Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. I'm Pat Tuhi, and uh, so what we're going to run through today is a look at, um, in the context of greenhouse gas mitigation, what the role of, of land drainage is, um, and water table control, and there's a slight separation there, um, which, which, I, which I'll get into as we move through, through the slides. So I suppose the background to this, and, and some of you have been uh, um, seen a number of these seminars, Friday morning seminars at this stage, um, and what's driving this, of course, is, is, is a number of documents and papers that are out there at the moment and that are driving policy going forward from the Chagas point of view, the, the, the um, MAC curve document, um, the abatement potential of greenhouse gas emissions in Irish agriculture, and that has formed part, obviously, of the, the government response in terms of the, the climate action reports and the climate action plans that are fairly recent documents. And, and, and in each of those, uh, and I suppose one leads to the other, leads to the, to the other, but in each of those, you'll see that the, the role of, of mineral and organic soils comes um, quite heavily in, in, in what role they might be able to play and, and the management practices that might be used to, to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions um, by treating those, those soils in particular ways or managing those soils in particular ways. So to go back to the, the first document, I suppose, uh, and the Chagas document, the MAC curve, there's a number of measurements in that document, and, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. But I suppose in, from the context of today and what we're talking about, land drainage and water table control, there are the three that you see there that are the major um, headline figures in, in this whole area. So measure 10 looks at draining wet mineral soils. Measure seven, comes, uh, I suppose, um, under that uh, draining of mineral soils heading as well to a certain extent, and, and, and we, we'll see that in a moment. And, and measure 17, water table manipulation of organic soils, uh, which is referred to in, in some of the, the, the writing and some of the context as, as re-wetting. So um, I suppose the, the draining of wet mineral soils is, is going to be a continuation of a lot of work that's already ongoing. The, the water table manipulation of organic soils or the re-wetting of, of peat soils, as it's termed, is a kind of, I suppose, a new um, adventure and something that we, um, we, we, we have to bring to the fore uh, as we move forward. Um, and it's something that seems to have certainly caught on in terms of the public discourse and public imagination of, of this whole issue and, and the amounts of, of carbon that may or may not be, be sequestered or be stored by, by manipulating water tables and organic soils. But the two figures that are there in, in red text, mineral soils and organic soils, I suppose, is, is where the, the big distinction is drawn. And it's in, in the case of any process or any management that involves soils, there's obviously a whole lot of differences um, or an array of soil types, an array of, of materials that you're actually dealing with and, and how to deal with those varies hugely. So I suppose just to, to touch off both of those, what, what the definitions are, or what a, a simple straightforward definition of, of each of those is. Um, and we see there, and I suppose a, a picture painting a thousand words here, but um, mineral soils, uh, as it says, they are derived from mineral matter. So sand, silt and clay, which are familiar terms, I would hope for a lot of you. Uh, larger particles then is just referring there if there's you know stones or gravel or whatever but um, mineral matter is the principal um, part that makes up mineral soils uh, and then you will have you know any soil sustaining life or supporting life or, or growing plant and animal life has a certain amount of organic matter as that life dies and decays that that organic matter is stored in the soil and principally in the within you know a couple of centimeters of the surface is, is 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 where a lot of it would be stored but um it, it's there within the soil profile but generally less than 10 percent organic matter in those soils and and tend to be i suppose some of the lighter colors as you're seeing there um some of the the, the more productive soils i suppose um and tend to be obviously fairly widespread around the country the the other um, side of the coin then is the organic soil, so you've moved far beyond the 10% here in terms of what the organic matter portion is. Peats possess an organic layer by definition that's at least 20% organic carbon and have a minimum thickness of 40 centimetres. Histic soils, sometimes referred to as, as, as the drain peats, but 
um, a PET O horizon, uh, which is an organic horizon, uh, a thickness of 7.5 centimeters or more. So these, as I said, are the other side of the coin. The dominant feature here is the organic matter and, and the mineral matter. Again, there's going to be mineral matter there to an extent throughout the profile, but the dominant uh, feature, the dominant uh, makeup of the soil is, is the organic part of the soil. And then I suppose just to throw a bit of confusion in, um, there is the kind of halfway house of, of what's termed sometimes as the organo mineral soil. So um, there's, there, there's a, a longer definitions of, of, of this if you go into the, the, the literature and how this is, is um, defined, but just for the purposes of today, the main thing there, humic soils, uh, an A horizon, so the surface horizon, significantly more organic matter than mineral matter. And you can see there again, even by, by the two photos that are shown. So you have, as you get down into the subsoil, about what's marked as 40, which is about 40 centimeters in both those photos that you're looking at, um, is, is predominantly mineral matter, uh, different coloring, as you can see, but predominantly mineral matter in both those cases. But on top, you're looking at these darker horizons and potential there that you have as it says in the headline, more organic matter than mineral matter. So they're, they're kind of a halfway house in terms of, the, I suppose, some of the hit behaviors of mineral soils and some of the hit behaviors of organic soils, depending how they're treated. So that's a, a quick run through. And as I said, there is deeper and more detailed definitions of those if, if, if you so wish to, to, to look at those um, afterwards. In terms then of the national picture, folks, I suppose what we're just showing here is is what is um, what is the the area covered by these particular soils and and the column on the left is is headline there as mineral but in the context of today again in the context of of, of my interest in 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 the the poor drain soils it's the mineral soils that are imperfectly and poorly drained so you're somewhere about a million and a half hectares um, of those soils uh, if you go over to the right hand side of this. Uh, slide, you're looking at the organics, so the peat and histic under that head, headline. Somewhere, depending on, on which estimates you look at, uh, there is a bit of variation, but somewhere around 1.6, 1.7 million hectares. And then the humic soils, which are, as I said, a kind of a halfway house between the two, um, about 0. 0.6 or 600,000 uh, hectares on those uh, in that category. So look, there's quite a lot of the, the, these soils around the place. Um, for the peat and the histic, uh, as we'll see as we go on, they're, they're not all of that 1.7 million is under agriculture. So there's, there's quite a mix there as well. But those are the headline figures. And those are what's mapped with the um, Irish Soil Information System uh, a number of years ago. Um, and there is, there is, as always, I suppose, more work going on to refine those figures a bit further and to try and isolate uh, soil types a bit further um, and draw boundaries, I suppose, on, on various mapping projects, looking at, at, at defining those a bit further. Okay, so if we look then at the, um, the mineral soils, first of all, uh, measure 10, as I said, draining wet mineral soils. This is straight out of the Mac curve document. So, um, just a small bit of text there, one third of the Irish land area can be classified as poorly draining. Assuming that one third of this area or 10% of the total grassland area was drained by 2030 is, is, is what's in the, the, the MAC curve of, of, of what the, the, the measure would be. And you can see there in terms of, of, of what changes here that the measure is that you're reducing the nitrous oxide emission factor. So you have a higher emission of a factor for nitrous oxide from poorly drained mineral soil. So if they're drained, that reduces the cost then, and there is a cost associated with this, um, 16 euro uh, plus 16.2 euro per ton of CO2 equivalent uh, mitigated. The total amount there, metric tons, um, just shy of 0.2, uh, and the total cost there, uh, just over 6 um, million euro. Uh, the extended grazing then, and as I said, this kind of falls in to the remit of drainage when, when you start to read the fine print, I suppose. Um, measure seven, production systems that either require improved drainage or could benefit from on-off grazing. Uh, so again, the, the idea is here, if, if, if the, these soils were drained, there would then be the potential to utilize these soils in, in I suppose, the shoulders of the year or longer throughout the year when the weather turned a bit adverse. If, if they were drained and not waterlogged, 
grazing could be uh, extended uh, on these soils and then you have obviously better um, use of the resources that are there and you're not importing feed and so on and so forth. So a, this feeds into a number of different positives in terms of, of, of what that might do in terms of emissions. Uh, it was measured, it was assessed from 20% of the grassland area for these figures. So uh, a negative cost there, as you'll see. So there's a benefit here in terms of, of this also has benefits in terms of, of on-farm production or profitability, production, reduction in cost. So there's actually a, a, a negative cost or a benefit there. Uh, the mitigation potential uh, 0 0.066 um, of, a, of a metric tons in terms of the, um, cost then so again it's a negative cost so there's a benefit there of just over six million um and that's what it looks like in in the the form that it's presented in the in the mac curve document uh, under the the agricultural mitigation heading you'll see there over on the um if i can see if hopefully you can see that cursor the drainage is over there so um there's a cost along this axis cost is here uh, on the left hand side uh, and there's a um, potential mitigation I suppose along the bottom so so the width of the band indicates the mitigation potential and the height of the the band indicates the of the bar indicates the um, the cost associated with it and you'll see over here then uh, in terms of the extended grazing so again it's on the positive side in terms of there's a negative cost um, and there's a potential as well saving there in terms of, of um, mitigation. So I suppose this measure is, is, is ties in I suppose very well with the, the heavy soils program. So the heavy soils program has been pushing a number of these measures for the last number of years both in terms of, of pushing the drainage of, of soils in appropriate locations and, and pushing the, the extra utilization or, or the greater utilization of, of grasslands in terms of drainage infrastructure, grassland management, um, you know, improving soil fertility, all those elements are, are part of that program. Um, and for today's purposes, I suppose, uh, I don't need to go into this in, in too much detail, but suffice to say there is different drainage systems developed that can be used in different soil types. Um, there's two broad types of drainage scheme that are used, and these depend on, on the particular soil type that's, that, that, that you're dealing with. Um, a groundwater drainage system, a network of deeply installed pipe drains exploiting permeable layers, and a shallow drainage system. Uh, if your soil is heavy and infiltration of water is impeded, um, then permeability needs to be improved at all uh, at all depths. So there's a, a a system that's suited for that. So again, various systems that can be put in place to, to drain these soils, and, and that's what we have been pushing, I suppose, in terms of the demonstration sites and heavy soils programs for the last um, couple of years. There's a bit more detail there in terms of how these systems actually work. Um, as I said, the, 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 the idea of the groundwater drainage system is that you're tapping into a reserve of, of groundwater and, and lowering the water table there uh, through that, through that um, natural capacity, I suppose, for water movement. Um, the shallow drainage system uh, employs the implements that you see there in the photographs to, to fracture and crack the soil and try and improve structure to get water moving off the surface. So again, it promotes water infiltration, it promotes uh, drainage closer to the surface, and, and there's a number of different methods that can be employed there. Um, and of course, all these methods, it's dependent on the soil type, it's dependent on what's possible in terms of landscape position and, and outfalls are. It depends on the economics, certain enterprises won't justify the cost of some of these systems and so on. So there's a kind of a natural selection there of, of what fits where and what's possible where and what's possible financially and economically in, in different parts of the country and different enterprises. So those systems are in a number of years. Um, we've monitored those sites in terms of weather, in terms of water table control, in terms of discharge. <coughs> Excuse me. And I suppose what point I'm trying to make here is that we've shown, and there's a number of publications there that have shown how well or how these drainage systems are performing, how they suit particular soils, what the particular systems are, uh, 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 and how, what the outcomes are for, for these systems when they're installed on, on appropriate soils. Um, yeah, and, and, and the headline figure, I suppose, is, is where the right system is installed on, on these mineral soils. Um, you're shown to reduce the overall period of water logging, improves surface conditions, and, and coming back to that extended grazing point, improving the capacity that these soils have for, for grazing or for, for use 
uh, I suppose, longer throughout the year. And in line, in, in line with that, then, we have been pushing, I suppose, a number of, um, both in terms of, of on-farm events, in terms of publications, in terms of different articles and, and, and events that have been held, to try and, uh, I suppose, drive that message home that there is uh, ways and means of, of appropriately training particular soils and, and how best to do that and how best, how, how most appropriately to do that uh, in terms of, of accessing information on how, how that might be done. Okay, so the, the other issue then, as I said, is the um, measure 17 as it is in the Mac curve document, water table and manipulation of organic soils. And the fine print, as I said here, if drainage was stopped completely and natural water table conditions were restored on 40,000 hectares of re-wetted grassland. The nature of the measure, as you can see there, is, is, is as I've said, re-wetting of that 40,000 hectares. Uh, the cost is there, uh, the mitigation potential, and a total cost then in terms of, of, of just over 4.8 million euros. So that's the, what's what proposed. And like the Mac curve, all the measures, there are certain proposals put in um, and, and depending on policy going forward, I suppose, will dictate how that's done. But this is the proposal and that's the, the potential for mitigation and cost. In terms of, of land use um, mitigation, this, this uh, graph is pulled straight from, from the Mac curve document again. And you see it there, if I can find my cursor again, um, which I can find, there it is. Um, down here, you're seeing the, the water table management of organic soil. So there, there's quite a bit of mitigation potential there in terms of the weight of that bar. And the cost, I suppose, is there is a cost, but um, compared to some other measures, it's, it's, it's relatively low. Um, so as I said, depending on, on how that's implemented, uh, that is the proposed measure in terms of the organic soils. Okay, so this then is a... Um, Another figure from uh, a Paul et al. paper uh, published in, in late 2018, um, looking at the total areas of, of the organic or the histic soils as they're described in, the, in this um, graphic and the humic um, soils lower down uh, on the right hand side here. So both the area on the bottom in terms of how many hectares and the, the emissions that are coming from those soils. So um, as you can see there, there's quite a difference in terms of, of this, this estimate in terms of what the emissions are from, from the histic or the organic soils along this line up along uh, mid twenties in terms of, of where it's sitting in the graph versus the humic soils a lot lower obviously because there's, there's lower organic matter uh, content in those soils. It's worth saying, I suppose, and it's highlighted there uh, on the bottom of the, the slide. The uh, modeling that you're looking at was based on extreme drainage situation with a very high water table before drainage and a very low, low water table afterwards. Less extreme hydrological situations may result in lower emissions. So looking at that paper and, and looking at the studies that were done, and there's a number of other, stu other studies that I'll be showing in a moment, but um, Suffice to say, I suppose that this is the 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 uh, a, a more uh, an outer limit in terms of of, of some of the um, potential or emissions that are that are estimated. So, for taking for example the organic soils in that study looks at a water table being maintained in drain peats at 1.5 meters, which technically is possible, but would be very expensive and wouldn't be. Might be possible over small areas, but wouldn't be sustainable. Um, certainly, over over numbers of years and decades, uh, in terms of, of, of over large scale areas. So it's a it's a higher end if if all these soils were, were drained fully, uh, and if all the both in terms of the organics and the the organo minerals or the humic soils. So any anyway, whichever way you slice it up there's a good lot, there, there, there is a, a large amount of emissions coming from these soils and the more organic matter you have, the higher that is. This is some other work that was done um, in terms of the table. When we look at the, the breakdown of that 1.6, 1.7 million hectares that I discussed uh, earlier on, in terms of what that looks like uh, in, in the different categories that are outlined there in the table. So if you look at the, the what's highlighted with the red uh, border uh, there that popped up, the farmed peatland in that category, uh, in, in that table is categorized at about 
just shy of 300,000 hectares under grassland and under cropland. Um, the bottom, last bullet point at the bottom shows the, the, um, the MAC curve assumption, which is about 370,000 hectares. So depending on what way you define these things and how they're accounted, you can get variation around that figure, but uh, there is estimates there somewhere that order 300, 350, 370. And that 370 figure um, is, is drawn straight from, uh, the, more or less directly from that Paul paper that I showed a moment ago in that study in terms of how much drained peats were out there. Um, so it's, it's defining that, I suppose, what area of the total 1.6, 1.7 million hectares is under the remit of agriculture and then going forward, how much of that is is uh, is is drained, and how much of that can be undrained or can be rewetted? I suppose is is the question going forward. So, with that in mind, there are or there have been a number of studies looking at um, mapping of the, the 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 soils that are out there in terms of the soils I'm talking about, the organics, the 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 carbon rich soils, as they're often termed. Uh, the, the, the histic and the humic soils, crossing that with land use uh, and, and soil drainage class and looking at the various different um, mitigation potential in terms of if those soils were to be reverted to, to wetter conditions, what the, the conditions would look like and, and what the mitigation might be. Um, so some of these figures are, are this is from the, the, the Paul paper again, on the left hand side there is, is obviously the map showing the, the, the um, organic or histic soils scattered throughout the, the country. Um, and on the right hand side is showing some of the high organic uh, humic soils. Um, so the green is showing the, the, the organic or the histic and the, the, the different colors as you see there in the legend up on the top here. Uh, and these numbers refer to different soil series or parts of different soil series. So the, the obviously the ones that are most visible, I suppose, visually from, from what you're seeing are the, the, the purpley color, uh, the yellow color, the blue, you know, so there is a number of those scattered in various parts of the country again, uh, depending on, on your area of interest, but they're fairly widespread throughout the country. Um, so what's already artificially drained, and, and this is a, an, an outer limit again, I suppose it's worth saying, 370,000 hectares of, of the histic soils, the, the, the organics, and 426,000 hectares of humic soils drained. So again, this is what's under the, the remit of agriculture. This is not to say that there isn't other uh, organics uh, that are drained for under under other purposes or under other headings, as, as we showed in one of the tables. Two or three slides back. Um, okay, so we can we can we can move on to questions fairly soon because I, I I want to summarize this up. Um, so the, 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 the headline figures there, folks, I suppose, the drainage of mineral soils is positive in terms of greenhouse gas emissions mitigation and can also contribute towards extended grazing. Uh, annual emissions are estimated from drained carbon-rich soils, so the ones we've been discussing, estimated up to uh, 8.7 teragrams um, from histic soils, uh, CO2 equivalent, uh, and 1.8. So you can see even there again, if you take the headline figures, the organics are, are, are a lot more troublesome in terms of what the uh, emission rates are. Uh, and this is from the, the Paul paper again, but it's, it's, it's an outer limit, but it is potentially what's, what the potential is if all these soils were effectively drained um, in terms of, of the headline figures you're looking at there. Um, lower down then, as we move down along the slide, uh, national policy, obviously, the reason we're discussing this, there is a recognition of the, the importance of preserving the carbon stock in the organic and, and humic soils. Um, but there is, I suppose, a need for uh, various different policy and various different procedures to, to make a rea this reality in terms of how these are managed or minded or maintained going forward. Uh, and what we're looking, I suppose, to do now is get more and more information in terms of, we have an outline headline figure of what might be there in terms of drained soils under these different categories. Um, but we need to refine that further. We do not know, as it says there, the area of drained organic soils uh, totally and utterly. We have a lot of estimates and we're getting closer to, to knowing, but um, we do not have a final figure. 
uh, we do not know how much has reverted to undrained conditions. So this is a very important, I suppose, point to make is that if a drainage system uh, was installed in uh, an organic soil uh, 20 years ago or 15 years ago or 30 years ago, the chances of that uh, still maintaining a controlled water table. I mean, every, every drainage system has a limited lifespan and no matter how well or how much is invested in getting uh, the drainage system installed, uh, it does tend to revert back in time and, and some soils revert back a lot quicker than others. But um, there is, there is uh, um, an assumption out there that a lot of the soils that are drained, uh, there may be still uh, an impact of, of the changing hydrology of the drainage system on that land area, but um, it's generally going to be not as, as extreme as, as one might assume that it, it, in a condition that the drainage system was fully operating or fully working. Um, so we, 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 we need to get, a, I suppose, a better handle on that in terms of how much of these soils are actually drained and how much of them are effectively reverted back naturally over time um, as, as, as various different um, schemes expire, I suppose, so to speak. Um, and further research, we'll, we'll need to explore the site suitability, cost effectiveness, as well as trade-offs and co-benefits of rewetting. So if you take the figures uh, from the Mac curve document of the cost in terms of the total cost to uh, carry out this mitigation measure, um, there are certain assumptions taken there, but suffice to say that you're not taking the, the very expensive or the very uh, cost, in effect, cost inefficient um, parts of the country that this would be carried out and you're taking some of the lower hanging fruit and looking at where the most effective ways and means of, of, of in, um, actually implementing this measure uh, would be. Um, and then you're looking at the, the, the trade-offs and, and the, the other benefits of rewetting and how that might work and how that might sit with the, the landowners in question and what, as I said, policies and what procedures would be needed to put in place to get um, to get this off the ground and, 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 and what value would be associated, I suppose, with these different soils from, from the different stakeholders that are there. Um, this is a um, summary then just again, just the final slide, uh, so we can I, I can stop talking after this, um, is showing the first three blue bars that we saw earlier. And then we're showing in the green just those, those upper limits of what's assumed to be drained in, in the humic uh, the organic soil or the organic mineral soils, the, the halfway house as I described them, and, and what's drained in the peat and the histic at the upper end again. And from that, you know, uh, one of them is, is north of 400,000 hectares, one of them is south of 400,000 hectares, but they're in that ballpark. From that, then we're talking about 40,000 hectares uh, as a minimum in terms of, of what's in the MAC curve and trying to find from that uh, column on the right hand side the 370,000 hectares. To get that 40,000 hectares, there might be, you know, for, for, for round figures, there might be 150,000 hectares of that that's relatively low hanging fruit, um, you know, and depending then on, on, as I said, policies and procedures that are put in place, how do we get the 40,000 hectares out of that is, is where the conversation is, is, is going to go on and is already going, I suppose, in terms of how, how that might be implemented. So, um, that is the, the, the yeah, well, that is the final slide. So I suppose we can, we can open up to questions. Um, That's great, uh, Patrick. Thank you for that excellent uh, presentation. And uh, I don't think you left too many stones unturned there, if you pardon the pun. Um, Pat, you spoke about, you know, the trade-offs uh, in, in relation to uh, re-wetting. But are there trade-offs in relation to drainage? Uh, you know, in advance of today's uh, webinar, I have been speaking to a few people, and they just we we're discussing, I suppose, some of the, the the notion of pollution swapping. Are there impacts on water quality um, from drainage? I know that there are concerns around that, and particularly inappropriate drainage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the concerns are there, and I suppose what we're trying to get at is putting in systems that are appropriate in terms of suiting a particular landscape position or suiting a particular soil type. I mean, when you, when you install any drainage system, you're going to change the, the dynamics, I suppose, of how water leaves that particular system. So a system, an undrained um, 
farm or undrained field or undrained part of the country has if if well we've had a relatively dry weather recently but if we had a wet period like we had back in february rain being added to that system is leaving as overland flow or is leaving as groundwater is leaving the system anyway uh, when you put in a drainage system you change the dynamics of how that leaves so it might leave uh, at a you know having interacted with a different part of the, the soil profile it might leave quicker it might leave through uh, uh, avenues and have as i said different um connections to different parts of, 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 of a, a, a regime in terms of a soil profile or whatever. Um, so we do need to be careful in terms of, of mitigating against that. And, and a number of different pieces of work have been carried out over the last number of years. And, and like I said, I suppose kicking off, Mark, there is horses for courses in terms of how you deal with particular soils. So the, 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 the losses that you, I suppose you can't say that losses will be a drainage system will create X, Y, or Z in terms of losses. It very much depends on the management practices on, on that particular piece of land and, and the soils and how they mitigate against that. Um, so I discussed there deeper and shallow, shallower drainage systems as well. That's another variable in terms of, in terms of, of what the, the water leaving a farm interacts with, that's very different in terms of whether the system is shallow or whether it's deep and, and what soil it's, it's interacting with along the way. Um, so it's really important to get good advice when uh, someone is considering a drainage uh, plan. Um, I know you run a course, an excellent course on this, um, and, and perhaps there will be some, some uh, uh, requirement for people to seek advice when doing drainage because I, I know Pat you often say you know uh, and I've heard your colleagues say you know inappropriate drainage can cause more problems or inappropriate solutions may not solve the problem and and you can cause further problems I presume that's that also goes for greenhouse gas emissions that where you have an inappropriate drainage system uh, or design put in place yeah, so as, as you mentioned, we've been, uh, I touched up it there, running a number of different um, courses and workshops over the years to try and spread the gospel on this to a certain degree. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's a fair point. Um, you know, and it's worth bearing in mind on, on, on any particular farm that we'd be involved with or that we would be running at different events on or, or visiting for different events. There would be you know, there, there's never really a case where you have 100% of a farm that's that's artificially drained. You might have, you know, 20% and that might rotate around as systems get rejuvenated and as their, their lifespan kind of ends again. Um, so that then obviously you, you have an opportunity to select for, you know, avoiding troublesome areas and avoiding, you know, maybe floodplains or areas that are, that are having... Um, you know, a, a, an overtly negative impact and picking and choosing in terms of what might be the best or most appropriate place to put a drainage system and, and how to monitor that. And there's also work going on in terms of mitigating losses. So as I said, whether a drainage system is in place or not, there is water leaving uh, a farm and, and, and a piece of land. Uh, so mitigating against that, I suppose, is, is where we need to look at going forward as well. Okay, uh, Pat Murphy. We have yeah, there's a, I suppose a couple of questions uh, coming in, uh, and one, uh, a few around the kind of topic of what might uh, a rewetted uh, soil, uh, organic soil, look like, and what kind of uses can be made of that, or what kind of benefit can they derive from that? I suppose both agriculturally and environmentally. So the the. If these soils, and, and again, there's the question of how much of them are out there that are drained to significant depth, but if they are rewetted, you change the regime. And, and look, a water table is a, a fluctuating thing, but um, you could take a mean water table from being a meter or a meter and a half deep up to you know, a half a meter or close to the surface. Um, then you change how that, how that soil behaves. So there's, there's less... Um, potential for less losses then in terms of, of, of the carbon levels that are there can be maintained longer. Um, and then depending on the regime and depending on the, the, the important point I suppose to, is that you're manipulating the water table. So you're not necessarily inundating this um, piece of land if, if it wasn't originally inundated with water. So there may be still um, scope there for, for, for particular um, 
practices or particular management to go on. Um, uh, it, it all depends on on what level you 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 you're required to bring the water table back to. So um, there is there is a huge I suppose question there in terms of as I said uh, in, in the summary. Uh, what value different stakeholders put on the different land that's that's at play here uh, and how we kind of set up policies around that is going to dictate how how, how this goes in terms of, of the value that we can see out of it both from the landowner's point of view and, and the, the broader questions of, of the mitigation. Okay, just I, I suppose a, a, a related question to, to what Mark was talking about, and it's one here, the reduction of, of NTO from drain land is obviously a benefit in terms of greenhouse gases, uh, but what about water quality? Draining uh, can increase the losses to, to water, uh, so how does the benefit of reducing greenhouse gases versus water quality weigh up? And I suppose the related question to that that is, is mentioned is the balance between losses of, of N and losses of P, where I suppose there's a potential that the losses of P, which are normally over overland flow, uh, are potentially reduced, but nitrogen may be, may be increased. Yeah, so there, there, there is that issue, and that, that gets to the heart of it really, Pat, that the, the dynamics of how um, the, the losses occur changes. So generally speaking, yeah, an international research would show that, that um, from various parts of the world that you're likely to get increases in in losses, but you're reducing P losses because you're reducing overland flow and, and the sediment losses, in particular P losses. Um, so there, there has to be a balance there. It goes back to what, to what Mark asked earlier um, in terms of what the potential for losses here, what the overall benefit is trying to mitigate against those losses uh, and, and you know there is ways and means of even simple things like sediment tracks traps um prevention of, of bank erosion um those kind of things that, beca that can be done by 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 proper planning i suppose and and by working um to to a plan and and, and as i said um picking the areas of the farm that are that are most beneficial and 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 least um least troublesome in terms of what the other impacts might be um, and, and utilizing that as best you can. Pat, I have a, a technical one for you. Um, I, I'm just going to read it out to you. Uh, it, it says, uh, full wetlands accumulate carbon very slowly as peat because most fresh organic matter from photosynthesis is deposited in such an anoxic conditions gets converted to methane. And if we believe the IPCC, that methane is 28 times more powerful, uh, GHG or greenhouse gas, than CO2, does this not make uh, new man-made wetlands greater sources of global warming methane than any advantage as carbon sinks? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, it depends on what you call a man-made wetland. I mean... Total artificial uh, wetlands are, are treated differently in the IPC document, which um, I don't have to hand, but in terms of the emission factors that are there, there is different assumptions made for constructed wetlands. Um, and in terms of, of, of the um, redevelopment of the organic matter, um, yeah, there is there is a difference, I suppose, in terms of it's not like flicking a switch and, and, and um, potentially reverting back immediately, but there is the potential there for the development over time of that. And there's all, there is an immediate effect in terms of, of uh, relatively immediate effect of stopping any more losses that would occur in the next year or decade or so on. Um, so there's different, um, there's different ways of means of, of accounting for the different, uh, if we're talking about man-made wetlands or, or re-wetted carbon or, um, you know, uh, undisturbed carbon banks. So that there, we're, we're talking about a number of different things there, I suppose. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Pat, uh, Gary, Professor Gary Lanigan, who we spoke with a, a few weeks ago, he talked about the, the peatlands as our rainforests. And I thought it was a good analogy. Uh, what's going on uh, at a national level there, Pat, to, to try and realize the benefits of, of that rewetting? Um, are you aware of the the programs that are are underway there? I know Border Mona are embarking on some programs around rewetting. 
Yeah, so there is a number of different um, stakeholders involved. Like like I highlighted there, there is, you know, we take the round figure of 300,000 hectares under grassland and cropland. So take that as being agricultural. Mm -hmm. Under the agricultural remit, there's a lot more. There's what another 1.3 million hectares that is out there. Uh, and there's a number of different, um, be it universities or, or Chagas or different bodies that are looking at um how that might look, what that might look like in terms of the benefits that are there from, from I suppose, our point of view, uh, it's coming back to what I summarized there at the end, trying to define how best to find those thousand hectares, uh, what approaches might be taken to try and get that um, land area uh, into this kind of a scheme and, 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 and looking at, you know, def re uh, greater definition of, of where those where those lands are and, and, and how to effectively um, draw them in under this in, you know, under this heading, I suppose. Uh, Mark and Anne, I think there's another, I suppose, suggestion rather than a, a question in, in, in the identification of those 40,000 that we take a balanced approach between the uh, uh, greenhouse gas mitigation, uh, biodiversity, I, uh, and uh, water quality when, when we're looking at those and looking at the future management of them. Mm -hmm. I think maybe that's more of a, a, a comment than a... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair comment. Um, just, a, a, I suppose, a fairly technical question. Uh, how are the emissions uh, factors calculated for the organic rich uh, soil? Is it direct measurement or is it through use of IPCC uh, factors or standards? Uh, and does it include DOC as well as CO2? Well, there's a kind of a, a chicken and an egg there to a certain extent, Pat. I mean, the IPCC standards are derived from numerous studies and, and direct measurement. And then there is ways and means of applying those to particular um, land types or particular um, scenarios. Um, and then there is continuing work to try and make those emission factors more appropriate or more accurate. Um, for particular parts of the world or for particular scenarios in terms of, of be it soil types or be it you know all the various different elements that, that are that are under this um in area so it's um depending on what's available i suppose uh, if there is more appropriate data available for a particular scenario in question then that would be the go-to if there is emission factors that need to be drawn from ipcc work that's again derived from direct measurement effectively, that would be the go-to. So um, that, 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 that depends, I suppose. Uh, I suppose that one question there is just a, a, a um, procedure. Uh, will, will the PowerPoint be available? Uh, just to say, yes, they will be available and the full talk uh, will be on the, the, the Chagas website. Uh, usually goes up the afternoon of the of, of the, the, the morning of the, the oh, sorry of the day of the, the presentation, Mark. Okay, um, so I think there's a point of clarification there, just coming from a colleague here. It says the emissions of uh, methane from wetlands is accounted for within the IPCC calculations. The net benefit is a large carbon sink. So um, that kind of uh, complements what you were saying. Um, um, yeah, so just on a related uh, topic, um, there's there's a, a, a question there about what, do we have any indication of what what is happening or is being planned in relation to uh, the Bordemona uh, uh, peatlands uh, now that we're looking at a, an end to harvesting for uh, uh, energy production. Yeah, well, I mean that's that's. Um under the remit of Ordnamona, I suppose, but the the it would be a, a similar view being taken in terms of how best to, to combine the benefits of greenhouse gas, gas mitigation, increasing biodiversity, water quality, and so on. Um, how they're actually doing that on a practical level, uh, I can't say, Pat, to be honest. Okay. There's a question here in relation to the, the extended benefits of drainage in terms of reducing the amount of imported livestock feedstuffs. Um, has that um, been uh, accounted for in the, the calculations, uh, Pat, or this, you know, that you're in, in the extended grazing, you're increasing the amount of uh, grass in the diet and therefore uh, reducing the necessity to, to uh, 
supplement. Yeah, so again, that would be accounted for in, in the um, measure seven of extended grazing. So uh, assuming that, that a certain portion of the land allowed for more uh, uh, utilization of grass and extended grazing, then there is a knock-on effect there in terms of uh, lower usage of imported feedstuffs. Okay, very good. Question, Pat, is uh, in, in terms of the mineral soils are, uh, that are, when they're drained, is there an impact on the organic matter content of those mineral soils when they have been drained? Um, bear in mind, I suppose, that the, the organic matter within those soils is, is, you know, somewhere of the order of, you know, less than 10 percent, two, three, four, up to seven, eight percent typically. Um, and that is sustained within the, 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 the surface horizons and in, in, in close to the surface, generally speaking. Um, so it would be relatively minor, I suppose, in terms of compared to the amount of, of organic matter that would be in the, the carbon rich soils, as, as they're termed. Pat, you mentioned the Irish soil information system in your uh, presentation. Could you tell us a little bit about that? And uh, it is a publicly available resource. Uh, and, and I think it might be useful for uh, people here today to, to refer to it. Yeah, so the Irish Soil Information System is um, available online. Uh, a quick Google, and I suppose be careful about Googling that acronym, um, but they have um, a number of, of, of different um, resources there in terms of how the, the, the whole process was done. The, the, being in the, the procedural um, setup of, of how the maps are put together uh, and uh, a searchable map in terms of the, the a probability map of soil associations um, that can be clicked on at any part of the country so uh, and, and background information in terms of the soils from which those um, those classifications were derived so there, there's a lot of information up there um, Irish soil information system uh, a quick Google should uh, find this fairly easily. Thanks, Pat. Um, we have a question, it relates to forestry, but I, 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 and we, we might ask it of our forester later on, but um, it, it asks about the, uh, is there any research done on agroforestry for the draining of mineral soils? Are there benefits to, to that, as, a, as a, I suppose, as a natural form of drainage? Yeah, uh, and that is another area that's being looked at. Um, again, I suppose um, Tom Houlihan will be here in the next few weeks and, and has a better handle on the different approaches that are being taken there. But yes, there is there is a, a view that that could be another potential measure. Very good. Pat, do you have uh, any more questions there? We're kind of run out of, of, of questions. If anybody has any more to, to get them in. Uh, yeah. Um, the, 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 yeah, a lot of questions around board Mona and the, the rewetting of, of peatlands there. Um, we have a question here, as part of soil management nutrient plans for individual farm, is soil type and drainage taken into account? Uh, at the moment, I, I don't believe it is uh, formally part, of, but it would be part of the decision-making process by an agricultural advisor. But maybe that's something Pat, uh, as a that should be incorporated into uh, nutrient management planning. Well, in fact, in the latest version of, of NMP online, uh, we are uh, taking into account uh, the, the soil type um, between light with, with, with uh, different recommendations now possible for, for lighter soils, heavy soils and peat soils. So yes, that that uh, is ongoing. I suppose up to now it was it was kind of a a, a single recommendation, but that in the latest version is now being taken into account. So the soil type itself, I, I, yes, is is taken into account on a field by field basis. You you now can enter the the type of soil that's that's in that field. Uh, and say it's not hugely differentiated. It's it's just a, a light so a light or a dry soil. Uh, a heavy soil or, or peat. Okay, okay. Um, so, I mean, yes, I, I, I do see that something as something that will be far more prevalent uh, during farm farm visits uh, and uh, will be, you know, uh, we've a lot of advisors have completed that course that, that Pat, uh, that you have delivered. Um, it's, av it's available to 
the, the private and, and public sector. Is that right, Pat? So he? Yeah. So yeah. Um, that course has run now for a number of years, uh, and we've had you know um, eighty, approximately eighty people on that course. So from all parts of the country and from all. Um, different uh, a number of different groups so uh, a number of our own advisors uh, private advisors uh, agricultural contractors um, uh, uh, so it's it's has run a number of years and will run into the future again okay Pat, uh, unless you have any other burning questions there I think we'll, we'll I wrap. think we're, we're through most of what's what's come in okay so look it, it leads for me to, to say thank you Pat Tui for an excellent presentation. Uh, Pat Murphy, thank you very much for your support on the, the questions. Um, what uh, I'd just like to remind everybody that, that again, that today uh, today's webinar has been recorded, will be available on the YouTube website, uh, Chagisk YouTube channel. Um, if you're interested in hearing more from Chagisk, uh, please do look at the Chagisk Connected uh, webpage where you can sign up for free updates on latest developments, uh, events and training. Uh, in relation to uh, Chagask, uh, particularly uh, targeted at uh, rural professionals. And uh, I also want to thank our, as well as Pat Murphy, uh, Andy Boland and Yvonne Maher, and of course our partners on this series. Uh, next week I'll be joined uh, by uh, Jack Nolan, who's Senior Inspector with the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, where we'll be looking at Ireland's nitrates derogation and what uh, is involved in uh, the review of that and how we can secure uh, that derogation over the next number of years. So with that, I want to thank you for your uh, attention today. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost Series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review, and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson, and thanks for listening.